I'm just going to wait for some people to join here. I'll just wait a couple more minutes and then I'll begin. Okay, so I think I'll start here. Um, this is Introduction to Museum Studies, Museology. I'm gonna get my, um, my slideshow on for you. So yes, introduction to museums. Um, today I'm gonna to be talking about the early development of museums, but before I do that, I just wanna do some introductory things. I know there was an introductory video posted, but that was more about me and my background. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about where everybody might be at in terms of knowledge of museums. Um, so, I'm sure everybody in their life has at one point had an experience with museums. Um, yeah, uh, everybody has personal experiences with museums and I'm very aware of that. And that's something I'm gonna be bringing to this course. Um, later, on in the, later on in the course, I'm going to be asking you guys to give me your experience on museums. Um, uh, as you will see in this course, museums aren't just a collection of objects, but um, they're arranged in a certain way. Um, this is um, this is a definition of museology. Um, museums are not just you know um, objects in a building. Museology is the practice of organizing, arranging, and managing museums. And it's also the study of the history of museums, their role in society, as well as the activities they engage in. So when we talk about activities that museums are engaged in, 
um, we're talking about like curating conservation education and public programming um, these are all separate areas that you can specialize in in museums um, so conservation is like the different temperatures that objects have to have to stay in um, and also the way objects are packaged and things like that um, I'll be talking about that later in this course um, and public programming and education later on in this course as well but um, the thing to know is that education can be both um, the way the community engages with museums and the way that um, museums can teach individual people and that they can teach schools as well. Um, a lot of schools, they encourage they encourage trips to the museum. Maybe that's maybe that's your level of museums um, going to a museum in school. That's great. Um, people in museum studies encourage that because it encourages interaction with objects at a young age and as I'll be talking about in this course, going to museums, uh, it helps you understand certain histories. Yeah, it helps you understand certain histories um, through objects and through a different way of learning than you might get in the classroom. Um, so yeah, um, as I said, today I'm going to be talking about um, early concepts of museums, but I thought just to get our head around, um, just to get our head around these earlier uh, museums, I would talk about some of the current definitions of museums, just to, just because this is an introductory course and because um, it will help us understand why these early museums are considered um, are considered early museums. So I'm going to read these definitions out, but then I'm going to uh, point out some words that I think will come across in this lecture. So a museum in its simplest form consists of a building to house collections of objects for inspection, study, and enjoyment. Um, so that's from the Douglas Allen, the former director of the Royal Scottish Museum in Edinburgh. Um, yeah, as you'll see, museums, they are for enjoyment, but museums primarily are for the promotion of knowledge and they're for um, just thinking about objects in a more in-depth way, I would say. You can think about history in terms of, you know, uh, looking at the entire culture, but sometimes looking at objects, you know, um, looking at things more directly helps. Um, so this next definition, a museum is a nonprofit permanent institution in the service of society and its development open to the public, which acquires, conserves, researches, communicates, and exhibits the tangible and intangible heritage of humanity and its environment for the purposes of education, study, and enjoyment. So again, we're seeing the words study and enjoyment. So these are things that are coming across again and again for museums, and they'll come across in the early museums as well. Um, and again, we're seeing education. Again, we're seeing that museums are a place for the promotion of knowledge. Um, yeah, and something we're going to be talking about is the idea that museums are are primarily for the tangibles. Uh, for the tangible objects, it is possible to present histories that are intangible as well. Um, we'll be talking about that in uh, a later course or in a later class where I talk about how we can display things that might be harder to display. And then the American Association of Museums um, defines a museum as an organized and permanent nonprofit institution. 
um, essentially educational or aesthetic in purpose with professional staff, which owns and utilizes tangible objects, cares for them and exhibits them to the public on some schedule. Um, yeah, uh, something I want to bring, something I want to highlight here is the nonprofit institution. Usually museums are there primarily for the promotion of knowledge. They're not there to uh, generate income. Uh, and another thing is um, an organized institution. I'm gonna be talking about this a bit today and in later classes, but museums, there are a lot of thought into museums, into how they're organized and into how they're, um, into how objects are collected and into how they're displayed. So as I said, today's class is gonna be about early museums and the earliest example of these museums are cabinets of curiosity. Cabinets of curiosity um, first appeared in Renaissance Europe. Um, they're usually referred to a room despite their name. Um, they're often called wonder rooms. Um, yeah, cabinets of curiosity stored and exhibited a wide variety of objects. So the main point was to show different categorizations of objects. Um, so mainly these objects were of the natural world. Um, oftentimes they were leaning towards the eclectic or the eccentric or foreign to the particular collector. Something I should highlight in Cabinets of Curiosity is that they were largely dependent on the collector. So um, it was a promotion of particular knowledge of the collector. Um, another common theme in Cabinets of Curiosity with it was that they were often organized into four categories. Artificialia, um, which means they were created by humans, created or modified by humans. So that would be like antiques or artwork. Um, naturalia, which is creatures of natural objects. So this is what you see. This is actually the photo right here is actually what you see. Um, Naturalia. Um, this is kind of like a cartoon of natural objects. And then there's exotica, which is exotic plants and animals. Um, and then there's scientifica, which is scientific instruments. So like medicine instruments and things like that. Um, these words here are all in Latin. So yeah, that was the origin of the Cabinets of Curiosity. Uh, one of the earliest examples of a Cabinet of Curiosity is that of Ferranta Imperato. Um, his Cabinet of, of Curiosity was called Del Historia Naturale. Um, this photo that you see on the slide is a representation of his cabinet of curiosity that was published in his book called Del Historia Naturale. Um, it's a visual representation. Um, yeah, uh, Ferrante Imperato was a naturalia collector, which is a natural science collector. And he was a an apothecary, which meant he prepared and sold medicine. Um, he also performed herpological um, experiments. So he used his cabinet of curiosity to display these different these different travels that he went on and his discoveries there. Um, Ferrante Imperato is known primarily for his uh, book, The Del Historia Naturale. Um, in this book, he 
correctly described two species of amphibia and five of reptilia. He also performed pioneering observations on the animal origins of corals. So lots of people were interested in his in his studies and in what he was doing. So that's what made the cabinets of curiosity so important. They were making th this sort of foreign or extraordinary, no extraordinary knowledge accessible to the public. Um, Ferrante Imperato, also his work in zoology and scientific experiments led to an impressive collection of uh, 12,000 specimens. His collection included numerous amphibians and reptiles. Um, yeah, he was just really, really important at the time. I think what's important about his cabinet of curiosity was that it's made his research public knowledge. And yeah. Yeah, this is another photo of Del Historia Natural. Um, I wanted to include this because it highlights the idea I'm going to be talking about, which is the categorization of the natural world. Um, as you can see here, he has um, identified different species. Um, so this is a rep representation of what is in his cabinet of curiosity. Uh, this is another cabinet of curiosity. Sorry, I need to find my page on this. This is an another cabinet of curiosity called the Augsburg Art Cabinet, which was gifted to um, King Gustavus Adolphus of Sweden in 1632. So this is what we would call an art cabinet. Um, it was designed by Philip Hanover. Um, its components were built and assembled by artists from 30 different workshops in Augsburg. Um, and it was filled with objects from Hanover's own collection. So again, we're seeing the public presentation of um, objects that might not be well known to the public. Yeah, this was called a miniature cabinet of curiosity. As I've said before, the cabinet of curiosities were normally uh, rooms. They were normally bigger and they normally had um, more objects, but still. And this photo on the right is of is a cabinet of curiosity of Frederick Roisk. Um, it's actually like the Imperato. It's a photo representation of what was included in his cabinet of curiosity. Um, his collection was more eccentric, um, and that's what that's what was interesting to people as well, looking at the eccentric and the, you know, the eclectic in the world. People like to see what they wouldn't normally see in the world. Um, Frederick Royce was known for carefully curating scenes with human bodies, as you see in this photo. Um, he was also known for pushing the boundaries between uh, science and art as you'll see here. Um, yeah, I think the public generally were interested in his eccentric views on the world. Um, Roisk tried to tried to present and tried to present a story with his with his objects. And this is what makes it kind of like a museum because Roisk 
Royce, um, he carefully organized his objects. So now I wanted to show you a picture of a modern example of a cabinet of curiosity. This is the Houston, Houston Museum of Science. Um, this collection is made out of man-made objects and natural objects. Um, again, we see a lot of different objects and categorized together. So yeah, there's a lot of different interpretations of cabinet of curiosity, but the main point is that objects, mostly natural science objects are categorized together and there's a lot of thought put into how objects are presented. Um, aside from cabinets of curiosity, there were other structures that were considered early museums. That's to say that they were actually categorized as museums and not cabinets of curiosity. Um, one of those is Princess Inagalda Nani. Um, she's considered the first, she's considered by many to be the first curator of the world. Um, Enigalda Nani was a priestess of the moon deity Sin and the daughter of Neo-Babylonian Neo King Nabonidus. Um, the items in this collection range from 2100 BCE to 600 BCE. Um, these objects were found in 1925 when archeologist Sir Charles Leonard Woodley uh, was excavating at UR and he found artifacts. The interesting thing about these artifacts is not only that he found them, but that they were organized into specific groups, even though some of them were from different geological areas. Um, and another interesting thing about this is that um, Woodley found some found some labels along with these objects. So before museums were even really considered museums, um, Enigalda Nana was grouping these objects together and making them more knowledgeable to the world. Um, the aim of this museum seems to be that that these objects were for educational purposes. Um, maybe people looking at these objects wouldn't have thought about grouping these objects this way. So Enigal Donana was taking the liberty of doing that for people who went to see these, um, went to see these objects. And again, we're seeing categorizing to tell a story. Um, Enigalda Nana obviously had a specific purpose in grouping these objects together. And she obviously thought a lot about, about what she was doing with these objects. And I think that's really cool. So the next museum I wanted to talk about was the Museum of Alexandria. Um, the Museum of Alexandria was, was within the famous library of Alexandria, which was one of the largest libraries in the world. Um, the library of Alexandria was the first research institute in the history of the world. Um, it was a center of educational science in the Hellenistic world, and it's where the pursuit of knowledge and the laws of the natural world were taught to subsequent generations. Um, yeah, it's usually considered an early model of a university. What I think about this library is that it connected the idea of studying in a visually and structurally magnificent building, and it promoted um, the study of knowledge. This is what museums are to this day, and I think it's really cool that this was an early example of that. And as well, 
I think the idea that it was the first research institute of the world, I think you might liken it to something today like the like the Smithsonian or something like that. Um, museums are very often now related to research institutes. And what encourages people is not only the idea of studying with these amazing collections or studying with learned people. Um, the encouraging thing is also the physical structure itself. And that's something I'm gonna be talking about later, what physical structure has to do with um, what we learn in museums and how they promote objects and how they promote learning. Um, just to talk more about what the Museum of Alexandria was like, or the Library of Alexandria, it had it had a palace-like appearance, and it had many rooms and a large walkway. Um, so yeah, it was very extraordinary, and yeah, I think it was pioneering for the time. The next museum I'm going to talk about is the Ashmolean Museum, which is called, which is often called the first public museum. Um, the Ashmolean Museum was established in 1682 when the wealthy antiquary, antiquary um, Elias Ashmore, gifted his collection to Oxford University. Um, I wanted to bring this up because it's sort of connecting what I've been talking about: personal collections. Um, being do donated to the university. So we're connecting personal collections and we're connecting the promotion of knowledge. And obviously we're connecting um, a grand exterior for these objects. Um, Elias Ashmore was well known for being one of the founders of the Royal Society. So again, the public would be interested in the personal knowledge of Elias Ashmore. This is something about museums as well. Um, especially at this time, the general public would not be as um, educated as people would be now. So the idea that you could go to a museum and that you could learn from an esteemed individual or at least experience the collections of an esteemed individual um, would be really interesting to people. Um, yeah, Elias Ashmore uh, was an avid collector. He acquired a large portion of his collection from two gardeners, John Tredescent and his son of the same name. Um, they had traveled the world and had acquired remarkable collections of geological and zoological items, as well as man-made objects. Um, I want to highlight this one too, because again, we're seeing the public being interested in the collections of a well-traveled person. This was another thing about cabinets of curiosities too. They were, um, they were the collections of lots of traveling. So people who wouldn't have had the opportunity to travel as much as these esteemed individuals would, they would be interested in that. And, I put this quote by Elias Ashmore, Asmol, um, because again, we're seeing the promotion of knowledge. So this was one of the one of the highlights of uh, the museum. And this is the last slide I have. Um, it's focused on the British Museum, which is the first national public museum of the world. Um, Obviously these other museums were really, they were, they were famous and they went over well. So the British Museum was founded from an act of parliament. Um, at first the British Museum wasn't open all the time to the public. You had to book an appointment and it was only open on certain days of the week. But then the need for a public museum um, became more, so the British Museum 
was opened longer, um, meaning it was open all the time. Um, it was the first museum to cover all fields of human knowledge and it was aimed at all studious and curious persons. So again, I wanted to end with that because again, museums are aimed at the promotion of knowledge and they're aimed at the learned, but again, everybody in the world has, has a, an intrinsic need to learn and has an intrinsic um, aspiring for knowledge. So this is why museums are so important. They make knowledge available to the public and they make it available in an easy way. Um, yeah, uh, next week I'm gonna be talking about what makes the British Museum a national museum and what that means for the world. Um, I'm going to be talking about the difference between specialized museums and small museums. So that's why I wanted to end with this. Um, I'm going to be putting these slides on Google Classrooms, but I wanted to I wanted to end on this so I could ask you guys what your experiences with museums are. I'm going to be including some of your answers in the slides for next week so we can sort of talk about the different museums and what you would categorize them as.